Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, I think we're ready to kick off there this morning. Again, thank you for your uh, time or your busy schedules to attend this morning. I know I'm conscious sometimes whether it's a morning webinar is better or an evening webinar is better um, uh, to suit people, but um, we've gone for the morning and we're going to be discussing all things milk quality. I'm delighted to have this webinar sponsored by Smactex Limited. We'll be joined by Brian Ahern after my presentation, um, which will be about 45 or 50 minutes, and hopefully it'll be practical and relevant. Now, I know a lot of you have come through um, sort of me advertising this webinar, so you know who I am, but just a, a quick background again. Um, I'm a veterinary consultant. I spent 16 or 17 years in, in veterinary practice and mixed practice over the last three and a half years. I've been, had various roles, including a, a very interesting stint with the Farmer's Journal, which uh, was a great experience and a great team. Um, just to give you a little bit of background this morning, uh, I suppose the way I'm thinking myself, I have a hashtag for this morning, it's uh, other things. Now hashtags won't solve your mastitis problems or they won't solve world problems, but if you want to share some of the information, uh, use the hashtag other things. So I suppose as a vet, I, I really started out looking at the individual animal health and um, I suppose you know, I moved and, and then realized over the years that prevention beats cure. And I started developing these programs in practice. And since I've left practice, and one of them is other things. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that. I suppose just as a lot of talk about farming in different areas at the moment, um, and I'm interested in what's happening inside the farm gate, but also um, outside the farm gate, because it will drive a lot of what's happening in our farming businesses. So I'll talk a little bit about that today. But I'm very interested in immunity at herd level. Um, I'm really interested, got really interested in how we feed our animals, you know, right back to soil health, crop crops, animal health. And I think, you know, Paddy Wall, Dr. Paddy Wall says that we're in the business of human health on farms. Very interested in the whole area of microbiome and gut health, gut function, um, and understanding the biology of animals and balancing all these things on farm. I think, look, we're in very strange times. There's no doubt about that. Um, and it's, it's, it's always easier to do these things in person with people in front of you. But uh, COVID-19, we're going to hear more, more about One Health, um, you know, there's going to be a big focus on the One Health story. We'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, like very important, I was on a webinar yesterday talking about the big S word again, probably overused sustainability, but very important to me that we actually have farmers, profitable primary producers on the ground producing food. That's so key. So farmer sustainability is key. So hopefully throughout the webinar that I'll make my advice as practical and relevant as possible. Um, I'm, I'm entering a, a, a new project, out of a five-year project with two farms at the moment where we're looking at a, some of these key areas in farms. So I'm looking forward to tell these story, uh, the story of what we're trying to do around people and training, nutrition, production, animal welfare, and, and some other big challenges there, are there. So that's just a little bit of background. I suppose I, I was lucky with, uh, to travel over, uh, with, with my Nuffield Scholarship over the last, it was over 18 months, two years ago now, and I really came up with this idea of cow-centered approach. And it's kind of what I pivot off all the time, whether it's cows or calves or sheep, whatever it is, really understanding what the cow wants. Uh, and I think if you look after the cow, she look after us. Okay, I, I did up a presentation and I had to throw it in the bin because it was too complicated. Uh, this area of milk quality, I can't cover it all in 45 or 50 minutes, but I will look at a couple of what I think are key areas to focus as uh, focus on as we come into the winter. So you'll see these logos coming back up during the presentation. Focus on the bugs, the bacteria that cause mastitis, hygiene, be it in the environment that the cows are, are in or during milking routines. You know, we're going to talk about uh, antibiotic reductions and responsible use, but antibiotics are still critical tools in, in our story uh, on farms and just using them correctly. Uh, you know, the immunity of animals, that's really important. Uh, I'm certainly not someone who loves data, but when it comes to milk quality um, and antibiotic use, data is very important. And I have learned a long time ago that it's all driven by people. It's all driven by uh, people advising farmers, ourselves, uh, and farmers themselves, milk quality. So there will be, there'll be the six pillars for the, for the conversation today. I will start on this antibiotic resistant piece, just to remind people, you know, there's, there's a, going to be a lot of talk about this and what is antibiotic resistance, but ultimately what happens uh, with bacteria is they're smart, they're built to survive. When we use antibiotics, um, we'll kill good and bad bacteria, um, but what happens is you get the development of these resistant bugs. Uh, and then over time, if we conti with continual use of antibiotics in human or animal medicine, we we'll get resistant populations. And these bacteria are smart, they can transfer that resistance. So that's essentially what antibiotic resistance is. Just to give people a bit of background on where I suppose we're gonna be talking a lot about milk quality today and antibiotics, 
intramammary and dry cow tubes account for about 2.8% of our overall tonnage usage across all livestock sectors in Ireland. This is 2018 figures. So it's quite small across the whole livestock sector. Um, and we have a challenge of this antibiotic resistance. So this is, a, a, again, a, a, something you'll see quite frequently over the next couple of years. There was a study done by Lord Jim O'Neill who looked at current uh, levels of these antibiotic resistant bugs. Um, they're causing about 700,000 years uh, deaths a year globally. And on and, and their projections, that could be up to 10 million people a year by 2050. 2050. So a huge challenge in human medicine and the whole One Health idea is that we're all in this together, both humans, animals and the environment. But I, I think we have to also recognise in Irish farming, certainly, where we've come to and what, the, the, what we've achieved. So this is our national cell count from 2009 to 2017. You can see across the national herd, we've reduced cell count by 100,000. Uh, so like a lot of these contagious bugs I'll talk about, we're getting a lot better. Now we're seeing probably more issues with clinical mastitis, but we've achieved a huge amount, particularly through, through the work of CellCheck. Again, if you look at our intramammary lactation tubes, uh, so our milking cow tubes, they've, they've declined significantly as well. But ultimately at a national level, I suppose, our tonnage of antibiotics used each year hasn't declined and we're all aware of the EU farm to fork strategy and looking for a 50% reduction in antibiotics by 2050 so we've some for 2030 sorry so we've some work to do but we have made some significant improvements now legislation does drive change and you know it was 50 years ago the five point mastitis plan was developed and a, and a key pillar of that was uh, dry cow antibiotic therapy and what we call blanket dry cow therapy and we've seen huge improvements from that. But the legislation coming into effect in January 2022, uh, and for the purposes of today, this line here, antibiotic, antibiotics must be not used for prophylaxis, preventative treatment to healthy animals. So except in very exceptional circumstances. So what we're talking about when we talk about selective dry cow therapy is not using antibiotics on cows that, that don't need treatment. So that's, that's really how that legislation is going to affect, uh, affect our farming businesses. So, I mean, does antibiotic resistance matter? Uh, it absolutely does matter, and it matters on a, a number of levels. And I'm not here to be lecturing people or anything like that. I don't make the legislation. But this is going to impact your farm businesses. So we've just got to be aware of this, this challenge. We've got to change our mindset around antibiotics as well. And you will hear a lot about One Health. And none of us are far removed for anyone who's needed antibiotics or like they're a, a fantastic uh, precious resource or tool to, in human and animal medicine and it's in both sectors we need to improve so we have to do our part but you know this is the youngest of uh, uh, the second youngest of, of my five children and, and she's the little weaker one in the bunch she's had two courses of antibiotics over the last eight weeks one from a wasp thing and one for a chest infection and you know the antibiotics work both times so we want to make sure that this precious resource are there for us in human medicine and we've got to play our part and this is not something farmers need to be afraid of it all because you know antibiotics are often we're treating disease and disease is a cost so prevention beats cure and we're not removing antibiotics completely so i thought a lot about this whole thing and about how we tackle this amr challenge and how we change our behaviors because ultimately we need to start with our mindsets and on how we view antibiotics and um, education is very important as well and i think hopefully that's what today is about I'm going to particularly focus on milk quality and um, because legislation is coming data at a national level is going to be very important we've got to measure where we are in relation at, at an individual farm level uh, so at her level and a national level and then we still need antibiotics we need to just make sure that we get the best results we possibly can from them and something i've been banging the drum about for a long time now is the whole optimizing animal health and um, space and and you know improving animal health is is there's, there's, it's multifactorial there's a lot of things going on and i suppose the cow centered approach for me is focusing on feeding you know the environment these cows are working in be it milking parlor cow flow uh, winter housing you know stockmanship this is a really important part of it. human cow interaction how we manage cows how we move them training in all these areas diagnostics and data and then of course the he herd health piece and vaccines worm control all those things are very important so if we look at the five steps to tackle AMR from a milk quality perspective, you know, we must think about, you know, the legislation is changing and we need to think about 
what how that's going to uh, how that's going to affect our farm businesses. But like something I'll talk about here is 50% of mastitis cases resolve on their own. So you know maybe we don't need to be using as much antibiotics on farm. Sometimes you know we have to look at treatment worthiness. Some of these cases I'll talk about you know they're not getting a response to antibiotics. So the legislation changes are going to affect dry cow you know dry cow use, and that's why selective dry cow therapy is going to be talked about a lot. When we look at data, we're very lucky when it comes probably to milk qualities. We have some very clear definable data around herd performance, be it somatic cell count, clinical mastitis rate. Milk recording, you'll hear me say time and time again, it's a must. Uh, we need to get better at measuring clinical mastitis. We need to probably get better at cultures as well and using them. And then when we look at treatment success, when we do use antibiotics on farm, we're coming up to the dry period. We need to make to make sure that we use them effectively and we're getting the best results possibly. And that's a dry period when we're treating clinical mastitis. And then the whole uh, optimizing heart health is kind of where I developed my other things program out about out of. And it's really about just trying to improve management practices that help reduce overall mass size issues. And one of the quotes that I think I came across over lockdown uh, is very applicable to farming, and that's progress over perfection. Farming is a difficult game, but it's slow changes over time. Okay, so look, just for a refresher, what is mastitis? Ultimately, um, it's bugs, pathogens, but typically most often bacteria. And these bacteria enter the teeth canal, enter the, ma the mammary gland, and depending on the level of immune reaction or the level of infection there, we see various signs. So we can see, we can see uh, no symptoms at all, um, or we can see clinical changes, uh, in the milk, the teat, the other, in severe cases, the cow, or we can see subclinical changes where we, where we actually don't, sorry, don't see changes in, in milk or anything like this. But ultimately, that immune response is where these white cells, white blood cells, so these are red blood cells, these are white blood cells, and these, these cells are it, go into the other in response to these bacteria. These are our somatic cells. Okay, so this causes inflammation, it causes pain, it's a welfare issue, but ultimately what's happening is this alveolar milk producing uh, cells in the, in the gland can be damaged and we're, we're seeing a serious loss in production. So this mastitis is a serious economic disease that we need to, to, to be mindful of. When we talk about mastitis, we'll often talk about contagious versus environmental mastitis or maybe subclinical versus clinical and ultimately Contagious mastitis is this high cell count cow or this infected cow comes into the, the, the milking parlor. And the only way she can spread contagious mastitis is cow to cow. And this is during our milking routine. When we talk about environmental mastitis then, it's when the bugs come from the environment into the other. And often we see, we term this as clinical mastitis. So essentially uh, on the top here, this contagious mastitis, typically your staph aureus, has only one way to spread, and that's cow to cow. And, and typically the easiest way for that to spread is during milking routine, uh, through clusters, through our hands. And this is why teeth disinfection during milking routine, post teeth disinfection is very important. Uh, but environmental mastitis, then the environmental mastitis, this comes from the environment. So these these bacteria infect, uh, these, these bacteria can come from the environment. So this is a cow to cow spread in the contagious and it's an environmental spread here. So it's important just to recognize those two differences. One thing we have to recognize, and I'll start here with the bugs, is typically since the five point mastitis plan and dry cow therapy over the last 50 years, we've seen a significant shift probably in the bacteria that we're seeing. So in broad terms, we talk about gram positive and gram negative bacteria. The gram positive bacteria, a lot of people have heard of Staph aureus. That's the bug we associate with uh, high cell count issues. Strep A galactia, we'll talk a little bit about that. Strep dysgalactia, we've seen a lot less of these bugs because of dry cow therapy. Now, there is other contagious bugs like Mycoplasma bovis. We're certainly seeing more of that. Um, but we, we're, we're seeing a rise in the environmental pathogens. So we're seeing more E. coli, Klebsiellas, Pseudomonas. And a, and a bug a lot of farmers would be familiar with is strep uberus. So a lot of our cultures are picking up strep uberus. It's certainly a bigger, bigger challenge on farms. And this is a bug, it's a gram positive bug that can actually start in the environment. So the cows can pick it up in the environment and it can also spread contagiously through the parlor. So that's a challenging one. Something to remember about bugs is, and this is a story we'll hear evolving all the time, is about 50% of mastitis cases don't require antibiotic treatments and research is showing that. Okay, so that's interesting from a, an antibiotic reduction perspective. But the big thing is, 
we only can know we only can make those decisions if we know what bugs are on our farms and um, so that's a tricky you know th but that conversation is 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 growing all the time around maybe on farm cultures or certainly looking at cultures and looking at treatments if you look at globally and this is uh, these statistics are globally, uh, you'll see it time and time again, no matter what country you go in. When we do cultures, milk cultures, to see what the cause of mastitis are, typically what you're picking up is uh, about a third, a third, and a third of uh, a third gram positive contagious bacteria. About a third of the bacteria picked up are gram negative environmental pathogens. And then the real frustration for a lot of farmers is a third of the samples come back with a negative culture. And what that often just means is that the bacteria that might have caused the clinical infection are gone and we're seeing the clinical symptoms. Now, a large proportion of these two will recover, recover on their own, but this requires a lot more, uh, you know, and it's about, I suppose, antibiotic use. That requires the knowledge to know what bugs are there. So the future will probably be decision making based on the bugs that are on farm. So right now on farm, we can build a bank of knowledge coming up to drying off. So in our spring-based system, when we come up to drying off in November, December time, we can look at um, what bugs are on the farm. And we can do this, we can actually, instead of taking a sample from every cow, we can actually freeze these samples and send them off in batches. And this is gonna be very important when we talk about selective dry cow therapy, but it's very important regardless of it. So we're taking a, a, a milk sample from infected cows, or infected quarters, and we're sending them off. But the procedure is really important here. So if you are trying to build up a bank of knowledge, you know, from a couple of high cell count cows, or maybe if you have a case or two of clinical mastitis over the next three or four weeks, we're looking to get the, the milk from the other, the infected milk. So we really need to do some good work on teeth preparation, sterilizing and cleaning the teeth end. The first two or three squirts go on the ground, and then we're looking at a putting that sample absolutely as sterile as possible as we can into the bottle. And um, so, you know, half fill, third fill that bottle and you can freeze those samples and we can send them off in batches. Uh, and this information is important in relation to antibiotic, maybe decisions, the, the decisions with the dry cow antibiotics we might use, even in select, when we're using selective, we'll still be treating some cows. And when we're using blanket dry cow therapy, it's important. There is a bug called strep, ag strep agalactia. You'll hear a lot of talk about it. We've thankfully see less and less of it, but it's a highly contagious um, bacteria that when we identify it uh, on farm, it really the current thinking is not to approach selective dry cow therapy, even if you're meeting all the criteria I talk about later on. So look, when it comes to bugs, we probably need to get a bit better at making good decisions with the data. Now, there'll be a lot of talk about antibiotic reduction, but they're still absolutely vital tools in our farm. And we need to just get a bit better on how we're using them on farm. So I've been very lucky over the last couple of years, pre-COVID, to do a lot of traveling, look at different countries and see what they were doing. And there was a, there's been a lot of focus, particularly in Denmark and Holland, about collaboration with, with, with farmers, vets, and advisors around treatment decisions on farm and actually coming up with treatment plans. So it's just about making sure that we're getting the best results possible. The other thing, and when I talked about mastitis, is, um, and I've no doubt about this, like it's mastitis is a painful, it's inflammation. So that infection goes into the other, it causes inflammation. So particularly when we see clinical mastitis, and I know from talking to a lot of vets and farmers about this, where we use anti-inflammatory medication as part of our treatments, we see much better results for the cow, I think, for the cow, at a cow point of view, but also from a treatment point of view, they make sense. <clears throat> now, there'll also be a lot of debate probably over, and I've listened to, during COVID, a lot of webinars on mastitis, the length of treatment for different bugs. You know, um, we certainly have our antibiotic tubes uh, and injectable protocols, and we're looking that maybe we need to look at more granular detail around what bug is there and what the, the length of treatments are for different bugs. And then we have the whole debate about systemic injectable antibiotics versus tubes. And this is really an individual farm conversation that needs to occur. And we can only do this by reviewing the treatment success that we've had on farm. And again, of course, when your cow is very sick with environmental pathogen, fluids and supportive treatment is very important as well. A lot of farmers this year have been talking about maybe some poor responses to treatment, and there's a number of factors here. So first of all, we need data. We need to understand, you know, if we're getting repeat cases, if we're not getting clinical cures, what could be happening? So farms with strep ubris, for example, um, certainly um, the antibiotics that we might use to treat them uh, might be different. So if you know, what are the bugs? We could have resistant 
um, bacterial infections in our farm or the, the bugs or resistance to antibiotics we're using. We could, we could have yeast or other um, infections in there that might not actually be susceptible to antibiotics. We could have very high infection rates. So basically cows are curing, but they're reinfecting because we have a lot of bugs in the environment or in cows. A very important one is these old chronic cows with high staph aureus or, or high cell counts. They, they can be very difficult um, to treat because they, they, their little microapses is high up in the quarter and uh, they'll resolve, they'll break down, they'll resolve, they'll break down. So we need to look at that. So if we repeat cases, if we've the damage to the physical barrier, that teeth end is the physical, uh, the gateway into the other. If we've, if we've damage done to teeth, that, that can affect treatments. Later lactation treatments tend to be harder. And of course, if cows are affecting multiple, multiple quarters. We also have to look at when we're getting poor responses to treatment or using the wrong protocols, poor hygiene. And this is an interesting one. <clears throat> if, if we're using an antibiotic to treat an infection and we're not uh, uh, have a good hygienic routine, we could be actually introducing other bacteria that, that, that may, may cause issues. Off-label use, there's a huge difference, and I know Brian Ahern is going to be talking about animal health monitoring, about early identification of these cases. So if we spot cases earlier, it's better. And as well, if you know, if we've severely sick cows, particularly with your toxic or E. coli mastitis, you know, supportive treatment of fluids. So there's a whole range of things, but it's just something to be thinking about. I suppose the, the, the thing for me today is maybe some practical advice and maybe get people thinking, asking more questions. Um, so mastitis and selective dry cow therapy. It's lots of conversations. You're going to, it's going to dominate certainly our farming uh, discussions and dairy farm over the next couple of weeks and definitely over the next 12, 14 months. So the legislation is changing. That's apology should be 2022. That is very important. We still need to use antibiotics right. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my other, other things program as well. So really it's, look, mindset, we've just got to get around our head on this. Um, that is going to be really important. Um, when we are using antibiotics, let's use them right. And let's focus on immunity in our herds. Okay, selective dry cow therapy. I said I'd cover this today. And if you want to remember nothing else about anything I say today, just remember one thing, and that's the whole area of hygiene around selective dry cow therapy. On the right-hand side here, you'll see my checklist for selective dry cow therapy, and I'll talk about checklists in a while. Uh, and there's a number of factors here when I think about selective dry cow therapy. But at a herd level, the first thing we need to think about is are you suitable? Is what are the criteria that you need to be uh, meeting at the moment to, to, to make that decision to go select a tricot therapy. We're very lucky with CellCheck in Ireland, and if you're an owner's farmer's tuning in from the UK, they've Quarter Pro, and there's, there, there's a lot of programs nationally in different countries. Uh, but if don't despair, like if you're not suitable this year for selective dry cow therapy, we have another year, it's, it's time to focus on cell count for 2022. You know, this is something that's going to be affecting your business. If you're not ready this year, make decisions on farm. And ultimately, when you have matched the criteria, it's all about the process itself. It's really key that we get, to, get the simple things right. So at a herd level, what are the criteria? And this is nationally, rec internationally recognized as some of the key metrics we need to look at. So your herd level somatic cell count, that's your somatic cell count over the year, should be less than 200,000, a rolling cell count of under 200,000. We have to be milk recording. So the data is absolutely key. Um, it's like throwing darts in the dark in the dark without milk recording. Um, so and one of the last milk recording should be 30 days before drying off. Now, if you're not milk recording, you're not doing selective dry cow therapy, I would say do not panic. Do one now. It's not too late before the dry period, because ultimately what that will do for you next year was, will allow you to assess dry period performance. And I'll talk a bit about that at the end. So it's not too late uh, if you're not doing it already, but the we've got to be milk recording. And then we've got to decide these cows that we're going to select to not treat with antibiotics, what is the individual cutoff level there? So a lot of farms I've seen over the years will keep a, a low rolling cell count of under 50,000 for the individual cow. Um, it's recognized that about 100,000 is the cutoff, and it might be higher uh, uh, as we learn more about it. So we have to set that. Then we've got to look at our hygiene and our housing, and there's a really important figure to look at when, you're, when you are milk recording, and that's your new infection rate during the dry period. So if we're doing a milk recording close to drying off and after calving, in the first 60 days after calving, what we're doing is we're looking at the amount of new infections that have occurred. So cows with a low cell count before drying off, 
and then cell count after drying off, they picked up infections, and that should be under 10%. And that's something every farm can look at when you're milk recording, and we'll talk about that. For Irish farmers, we can go into ICBF profiles, into milk profiles, and we can actually set our criteria and pull off a list of these cows. Uh, one big thing I'll say, another important point is that when we're looking at, uh, at, um, at mastitis control on farm, we've got to get better at this, but particularly with selective dry cow therapy, no cows who've had clinical mastitis in the last four months. Now, some people will say in the lactation, but I think in the last four months. Um, so we need to be measuring clinical mastitis rate on farm for a whole range of reasons. So a clinical mastitis case is going to cost between 250 and 300 euros. We can see patterns there. But when we're talking about selective dry cow therapy, we've got to ensure that none of these cows were using doing selective dry cow therapy have had clinical mastitis on. Or have had clinical mastitis. Sorry. So the other thing when we're looking at criteria at herd level is what are the bugs? So the, this information that we're we're picking up on farm by doing um, our, our sampling, if we pick up this bug Strep A galactia, the current thinking is that we shouldn't. Even if you're meeting all these criteria up here, we shouldn't be thinking about selective dry cow therapy. So it's a highly contagious bug, uh, contagious bacteria. So do you have that in the farm? So there are your herd level criteria. And I'd say for Irish farmers now that there's TASA funded three hour vet visits. If you're eligible for selective dry cow therapy, go onto the Animal Health Ireland website, your, your Chagas or dairy advisors, your vet will tell you more about this, but it's a three hour funded free vet visit to help farmers make that decision making around the data and drying off. It's, 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 it's a great resource. So whether you're going for selective dry cow therapy or blanket dry cow therapy, I think most of these pro practical tips still apply. And it's something we can think about coming up to drying off that hygiene is so important. So what can we do with our cows uh, before drying off that's going to help, help that? So clipping the tails in advance of drying off. Some farms that I work with, um, because, you know, and this can vary farm to farm, will have hairier udders and cows. If you have hairier udders and you've cows indoors, you can have more fecal buildup. It's more of a risk of flaming udders or clipping udders. But look at the cows. Just look at the cows three or four weeks out from calving or from drying off, sorry, and see what they're like and see what you can do. Now, one thing is for sure that antibiotics have allowed us to be a little bit carefree when it comes to drying off. Um, and we just need to change our mindsets around that. Um, what bugs are on the farm? Again, as I said, have you have you done some analysis there on when even you're selecting your tubes of what bugs are there? And that comes from your cultures. Key thing is you have to give it time, even when you're using sealers and antibiotics. So traditionally, you know, I, and I was drawing off cows last week, looking at different protocols, and it's the hardest job maybe on the farm. And I think a lot of farmers would agree with that. But even when you're using sealers and antibiotics, we still have to focus on hygiene. Um, and the question comes up then, if you're doing selective dry cow therapy, should we teeth seal or not? And now all the research is saying it's the right option and there's a reason for it. If you look at the way we've selected cows to be freeing milk and flow rate has improved or has almost doubled in the last 30 or 40 years. And that's put pressure on the teeth sphincter itself. So the closing of the teeth sphincter takes more time. So sealers are an extra layer of security, but they have to be used correctly. Okay, so we're coming up to drying off. We have our records. You know, some farms that, uh, that I'd be working with, depending on when milk recording is done, will even go for a CMT test. Again, it's another layer. It's something farmers need to think about. And if, again, if you've met the criteria and you've picked out your list of cows and you've ticked off all the boxes, just be aware of those cows that are freer milkers are more likely to leak their milk. There was a great question came in before the webinar. You know, old cows with low somatic cell count, should they, are they, are they okay? Absolutely. So it doesn't matter their age, if they're clean and meet the criteria, but if they have other teeth deformities, if they have teeth damage to that mechanical, mechanical barrier there, you know, we need to probably use uh, dry cow uh, antibiotic cow therapy on these if we've got warts on teeth. So you need to put all this together. And the big thing is a bit of planning, okay? Um, dry cow uh, therapy or drying off is something no one likes to do but it now requires a bit of planning. And I, I got pulled up last week uh, at a farmer meeting when I was talking about this. And I said, look, it's a two to three, two person minimum job, give it time, five to eight minutes a cow. And I said, look, focus on having maybe a dirty person and a clean person. And a farmer pulled me up and said, you should have no dirty people at this job. And he was actually right. So I'm gonna change my language today. And, and, and I'm going to apply this and we're gonna hear more about this. It's like a surgery. So I would now say you need two people a minimum, a surgical assistant and a surgeon, okay? Uh, when we're coming to actually the process itself, 
draft off your cows and milk them separately um, and then focus on teeth preparation and application so the person that's doing the drying off the key part for those person is their hands touching the cows the, the end particularly when you're in selective dry cow therapy the sealer itself so it's really important to focus on hygiene the wearing of two gloves so at least if you get dirty gloves you can whip them off and you can keep your process going maybe dry off maybe five to five cows at a time and um, so you're doing smaller numbers again if you're like the surgeon and um, the surgeon will have a light on to see that area if you have a dark parlor or a head torch treat yourself to a new gown um, and I, I, I have some swabs, cotton swabs here. So I was doing this last week. I was looking at the difference and a lot of people will be familiar with when you get your dry cow tubes or your sealers, you get your disinfectant wipes in them. And they're very, I found them very, find them very fiddly to use. So what you do with them is you give them to your husband, your wife, your neighbor, your children and keep them in the car to wash your hands when you're going into the shop. But what you should do is get your cotton soap swabs. So get your, your cotton swabs these are you can buy cotton wool they're much easier to use um, and use one cotton swab per wipe so if you're doing sealer you'll have one wipe per teeth and get a, a, a ziploc bag put your cotton swabs into them get your methylated spirits or alcohol soak them in and your surgical assistant will keep that bag open up for you and scrub the teeth with them so it's a very simple thing to do but they i think they work much more effectively now i i know when i talk about these things that you know it seems far removed from the difficult job of actually drying off. But the reality is getting this wrong will impact short term where we've seen cows get very sick after drying off or long term. And this includes when you're using antibiotics, by the way, because we can introduce infections even through poor drying off processes when we're using antibiotic therapy. So it can affect your long term somatic cell count for the following year. So give it time. Uh, and when you're using sealers only, just focus thoroughly on that hygiene and the procedure itself. So, you know, when you are putting in teeth seals again, uh, whether you're using antibiotics and teeth sealers, the teeth seal is going into the teeth cistern here. So squeezing the base of the teeth seal and anyone who's done it will know, you'll see the teeth swelling up like a balloon um, with those smaller teeth maybe, you know, you might only use half a teeth sealer, but keep that, that base of the cistern squeezed and move your teeth seal out as the, the teeth swells up. Don't go picking at it at the end. Um, it's, it's an important, uh, it's an important process that you do right. But ultimately, um, the tip of that teeth seal there, another thing that I've seen done previously is these teeth seals to get them to be more free, you put them into warm water. Um, and I've seen pseudomonas infections for that. So if you really want to, you're worried about teeth seals, put them in the hot press the night before, don't put them in warm water, but it's that tip of the teeth seal. So the surgical assistant is handing you the, the teeth seal. It's that tip is going in. It's the, the bottom of the teeth and the, the teeth seal into a sterile environment in these cows that we're not using antibiotics in. Um, on a farm, we've actually put another, uh, as part of the protocol, we put an outside external teeth seal, uh, a sealant on, on the teeth as well, just because I think this process itself is so important. So just focus on hygiene. Focus on the routine. Remember, and I know I'm saying the same thing again. It's the tip of the teeth seal and the end of the teeth we want to focus on. We want to really look at how we actually do the process. So you start with your right front teeth. Uh, if you, even if you're using antibiotics, you scrub the end of the teeth with that cotton swab. Throw that cotton swab away. Then apply your antibiotic. Then scrub that the end of that teeth again, and then you apply your sealer. And equally so if you're just your sealer. So you're going front right front left, back left, back right, so you're not going over yourself. So just focus on hygiene. That's my key message really for today. Some of you will recognize this Tommy the Turtle, this, this, this video from, from a while ago. If you don't recognize it, then it won't make any sense. But the message is we've got to give ourselves time in this process. Slow down and do it right. It'll be a great investment for future performance on the farm. Uh, we, you know, if we're rushing dry, you know, if we're rushing dry cow therapy, particularly sector dry cow therapy, that's when mistakes can be made. Now, so uh, if you're if you're if you're suited to selective dry cow therapy, you meet the criteria. Certainly engage. Um, if you're in Ireland with the with the veterinary um, TASA funding, continue to review process. Look at your look at your somatic cell count. Uh, uh, next year when, when cows start calving down. But the big thing is, if you don't meet the criteria, you're still trying chase somatic cell count control and planning. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about other things, my other things program. I learned a lot of lessons from this. And really, I started when I was working uh, in practice, I really was focused on 
I suppose, areas like Akuda was calf health, respiratory disease, and I, and I was getting interested in mastitis, but I had no process or no way of evaluating, and I was kind of doing it ad hoc, and uh, so I came up with a systematic way of just assessing mastitis problems, and one of my big learnings was, it won't surprise anyone, but a lot of milk quality is driven by people decisions and uh, workable solutions on farm. So ultimately, any of my programs are very simple checklist based. So, and the greens are as important as the reds because we have to recognize what we're doing well on farm, but it's like just, it, you know, and, and I look at it at three levels. I look at it at a herd level stress and immunity, then I have my clinical mastitis assessment, and then I go into subclinical or contagious mastitis. And it's really about identifying where are the risks? Simple things. And because I don't want to miss anything and I keep it very simple. And I, and I think it's absolutely key that the, we recognize what we're doing well. And it's about moving these areas um, from red to yellow to green. And that might be the reds I want to move straight away, but it's about slow progress. Okay. So some of the lessons I learned, <clears throat> and this is a reality, mastitis is multifactorial. Uh, it's one of these diseases that we often have to make a few small changes over a period of time. We tend to look for solutions and bottles and quick fixes. There often isn't quick fixes. Um, and particularly with protracted cell count issues, they take time and planning. They take hard decisions around culling and it's impossible to do it without records. Um, when it's, when I, I learned a lot about clinical mastitis as well and the role of immunity at herd level. And I'll talk a bit about that. So really getting immunity at herd level. So at an individual cow level, it's important, but at herd level. And it's people drive the changes on farm. So it's our own mindsets about how we, how we view antibiotics, how we view mastitis. And it's a, it's a significant cost. And, you know, it's very measurable when you look at cell count or clinical mastitis rates that you can put a cost on what this costs in your business. So you can, you, can, you can plan out better as well. Don't forget to focus on what's working. Um, and I was a devil for this on farm of going in and saying, this is wrong, that's wrong, this is wrong. The place to start is, well, we're doing this right and this right and this right. These are some of the changes we want to make. And targets and goals work. So setting a goal for your farm, where is your cell count now? Is, is it at 250,000 for the year? Can we get it down to 150,000 in 12 months time? You know, what's the clinical mastitis rate? Where do we need to go? It's progress over perfection for me. So the first level of the of the um, of, of, of my other things program is actually to start to look at the cows. And I think we don't do enough of this. I love that. Like, well, I love, I, I, I like looking at the data because it can tell me a lot, but it's, there's nothing like looking at the cows before they come into milking, watching for lameness, looking at dung, looking at body condition score, watch cow flow going into the parlor, cow behavior inside the parlor, watch that, that cow, human cow interaction. Um, really very important when we think about stress and immunity. Look for any nutritional stress in the farm, any other disease issues, mineral issues, and, you know, you will pe hear people talking about vaccination for mastitis as well. And vaccination certainly, um, I think, has a role to play. But if it's, if it's sold as a panacea to mastitis, it's not. It needs to, it needs to, we need to take in all the other factors. So at a, at a herd level, we start with stress and immunity. Because if there's a stress on the cows or there's a stress on the immune system, that can be a challenge. Now, when it comes to clinical mastitis, um, uh, people might have heard me saying this before, but I look at it, if someone rings me up and says they have a clinical mastitis issue, I look at three areas, thinking that this is mostly environmental pathogens. Um, I, I, I think about, um, okay, the, the environment the teat is in. That's the first area to focus on. Now, the weather has changed, cows are in at night time. So this is something to think about. The environment is that the, the teat is in. How clean is that, right? And the cows will often tell us that. And you know, farming is not easy. So it's not about, we're not going to live in a sterile environment, but what can we do around that area? The next thing I look at a clinical mastitis issues on in a herd is the physical barrier. This gateway, this teat, is the milking machine causing issues with teat function or is issues like milk fever, subclinical milk fever, weakening that muscle? And then finally, I'll go in and say, right, okay, those two areas aren't a problem. Let's look at immunity. All right. So I think really they're the three areas I think about. Weather can change. You know, so we're going, we're housing at night now. If you're housing at night, and if we think of the environment as a big challenge at the moment, is pre-dipping a routine we should be considering on farm? We probably need to get a little bit more proactive with the, the, the you know, so we tend to have a standard milking routine. We probably need to get a bit more proactive about challenges that are there. So even if in the summertime, if weather dramatically changes and we've more dung and dirtier cows, 
uh, and we're seeing a spike in clinical mastitis, people will ring me, I'd say, well, look, first thing is to start pre-dipping until we get there and we'll see. And, and that often can be, just, it, it can reduce the infection pressure on the teeth. So it's, it's these, this bit of attention to detail. Now, one thing I will say is, and this is something uh, that's very important, when it comes to selective dry cut therapy, when it comes to milk quality control, when we see the way the bugs are changing, we've got to start recording clinical mastitis cases because that will influence um, our decision making. And just think about herd level immunity. If we're improving immunity, we're reducing disease. And look, the reality at the moment for farms as we go indoors is, is don't shit is the risk. And, um, you know, the environment that that teat is in is really important. So this is where the extra, you know, bit of detail, the extra bit of work on lining cubicles, looking at running scrapers, looking at ventilation, that all helps. Maybe it's pre-dipping pre cows if risk is, a, is, is a, big, a big challenge. When I looked at subclinical mastitis, thankfully, as you saw at a national level, we're getting better and better. But we do see her still struggling with sub subclinical mastitis. And I haven't even mentioned the milking machine today. I mean, it's a topic on its own. And I've done the milk machine training, and it just shows that I'm, I, I wouldn't be a great engineer. No matter how many times uh, I, I do milk machining, machine training courses, I still, for, I, I, st I still haven't fully grasped it. But I can go in and I can look at the routine. I can look at milk, over milking, under milking. Um, the machine does play an important thing. But when we think about subclinical mastitis, you're struggling with subclinical mastitis. We've got to identify the cows that are infected. It's just impossible to do it without that because these cows, uh, subclinical infections, they are spreading to other cows through the routine, through hands, uh, through the machine itself. So we need to have data here. You know, if you're if you're tackling subclinical problems, you need to have data. We need to look at the routine then to minimize that spread and utilizing tools like CMT testing, California mastitis testing on the farm. And then we have to decide where our subclinical uh, problem is. We look at the actions we need to take. Then you look at treatments and how effective treatments are. You know, if we have these chronic cell count cows and they've been high for last year and this year, um, how, how, how treatments aren't going to work on these ladies. So culling is, is, is a part of the process as well. Okay, and um, just a simple thing that I would do on farm is, is, is looking at teats. So two things I look at is whether the, the teat end is rough or smooth and look at teat condition, whether it's soft or dry. And, and again, that'll tell us a lot about maybe teat disinfection. The weather might affect that as well, of course, but machine function. So if we're going in and we're teat scoring cows um, and we're seeing this pronounced uh, this roughening at the teat end, we've got to ask questions why, because that physical barrier is a very important part of the mastitis story. So again, and I've learned this probably not through mastitis, but all uh, 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 at every level of, of, of herd health, it's, it's, it's people that drive the performance of the farm. And whether it's individuals and their own milking or particularly where there's teams of people on the farm, that we've consistent routines, that we look at what we're doing. And if it's working, brilliant, don't, don't change it. But if it's not working, ask questions why, because the biggest impact on milk quality is people. And, and I found on, on, on maybe where you have teams of people, what are the, the, the goals of the farm? Uh, what are the goals for milk quality? And, you know, training, we can't expect to put people into milking parts and give them, uh, you know, we need to spend a bit of time with people, review and measuring these the goals. And it's about adapting management practices with workable solutions. It's easy to talk about farming when you're pushing a pin out a plow, as Eisenhower once said. So the solutions have to be workable, and I'm conscious of that as well. Some of the issues that I saw this year, very farm specific, somatic cell count issues, um, and certainly in larger farms where you have a lot of people in and out of um, the milking, uh, milking parlor, certainly maybe cluster flushing is something I definitely think is, is probably an investment on farms once it's not used as to solve all mastitis problems, but it definitely can help reduce the spread of infection once we take action on that infection. Clinical mastitis, huge learning for me on this over the last two years. The amount of issues that I've seen with clinical mastitis in herds that have been related to stress is very important. So when I think about stress, I think about immunity. So if you're seeing high incidence of clinical mastitis in freshly calved cows, what's the immunity like in the herd? It's always going to be a stressful period for the cow anyway. But, you know, subclinical mill fever, two things. It affects the teeth muscle and that physical barrier. It also is important in driving white blood cells out to fight infection. So could that be an issue? Measuring your your first your cases over the first 30 days, eight, cow, eight cases per 100 cows. 
then I saw issues in May time where lads were pulling out meal maybe a bit early, cows were at maximum peak, and typically two weeks after that, cows were coming under a bit of stress, you could see a bit of clinical mastitis, they were also coming into heat, so that would be a stressor on cows, and um, so just being aware of these stressors, these patterns, I've seen a lot of coughing cows again this year, and again, coughing cows, you'll see spikes in clinical mastitis rate, and I think it's down to immunity. I've seen issues with poor treatment success and a lot of these, and it's a topic on its own actually, is this whole strep uberus bug. So it's just, these are some of the issues I've seen on farm and none of them had a quick fixes. All of them involved stepping back and slow changes over time. Um, again, the data that's there, we have such valuable data um, if we're using it, you know, your cell check report, your, your problem cow report, and, and I'm going to talk about new infection rates and cure rates, but these, this data is very, very important. Um, and looking for trends, even in your cow report on age groups, uh, when, it looks, when you talk about somatic cell count, you look at if you've got that clinical mastitis as well, it can tell us so much. Individual cows, the problem cow report, we've got to get used to looking at that. And I can't cover it today, but uh, I, I know that Stuart Childs and, and Don Crowley did a fantastic um, chat on this on the Let's Talk Dairy uh, webinar, which is a brilliant resource. And I know they'll probably be doing more on this again. Um, but it's really was it was 45 or 50 minutes that I think Irish farmers uh, and anybody involved in the industry should listen to about Don Crowley's practical approach to using these records, because the, this data will really, really help us making decisions. Something that it's important to remember, um, we've got to get probably better at obviously milk recording, recording at the right amount of times a year, but looking at our new infection rates and cure rates. So over the dry period. So if we've got a high new infection rate, it's on your cell check report. If you've got a high new infection rate over the dry period, there's something happening during the drying off pro process, even when using antibiotics, or when that cow is dried off or coming up to calving time. So that's something we can focus on. The other thing we can look at from a perspective of antibiotics is our cure rate. So we have these high cell count cows coming in to drying off, we treat them and we're not getting a cure as well. So that can be a number of things that we've used the incorrect treatment or antibiotics maybe for the bugs or this whole idea of worthy of treatment. You know, are these cows going to respond to antibiotics? And remembering that they're a source of contagious infection, Sometimes, and certainly farms that are probably looking at wanting to get to the level of criteria for selective dry cow therapy, there's some hard decisions may, need to be made around culling. Um, so looking at your records there is really important. And remember that even if you're not milk recording now, you can start with one milk recording coming up close to drying off because even that bit of information next year would be allow, allow your farm to see how you've performed over the dry period if you perform another milk recording and continue for next year. It's just about planning ahead. Okay, the dry period itself, look, it's a rest for the other, the cow and the farmer. There'll be a lot of talk about heifers uh, as well, and we must not underestimate. Um, and I've really started to learn about cow and cow behavior when I started thinking about the cow-centered approach. But heifers are a huge risk because they do get really stressed when they come into a herd. Um, space, um, it's a big change for them. And you'll see a lot of these heifers when they calve down will have high cell count issues and they'll resolve again. That can often be stress. So we need to look at the data when it, when it, when it comes to heifers. We should certainly be CMT testing our, all our heifers as they calve down. Maybe every cow should be CMT tested. That'd be my approach. And of course, the whole debate about teat sealing heifers as well. Now, when it comes to teat sealing heifers, I certainly cannot um, doubt the science in it. It makes sense. I suppose from, from my perspective and where I sit right now is from a biological perspective is I always would prefer if we're asking the question, why are we getting such a high level of mastitis in our heifers? Teat sealing is one way of dealing with it, or could we look at why it's actually occurring? And maybe it's a space issue, maybe it's a stress issue. And that's actually going to have a more of an impact as well than just maybe the short term solution of teat sealing on overall heifer performance. <clears throat> Remember during the dry period that the risk period uh, is for the cow to pick up infections as well. It's about 14 days after drying off and 14 days pre-calving. So really putting a focus on hygiene in the environment uh, is an important, uh, important thing at that time. Planning uh, to tackle SCC. So as you approach the dry period, just a reminder, like the decision-making around dry period, uh, antibiotics is very important. And review your performance on cell check for past years on your new infection rate and cure rate if the numbers are there. So a lot of times, so when we look at those figures, we've got to look at the numbers of cows that are eligible to make. So we could have only eight cows maybe that we're looking at. And so figures might be important there. 
So just, I'm coming to the end of my presentation now. So dry period, housing is really important. And housing is important now because we've cows in at night and we might have them in by day and night, depending on the parts of the world you're in. So focus in the environment that the teeth's in, you know, if it's a cute, you know, provide space is important for animals as well. And again, space is a long term investment. Um, liming cubicles, attention to detail. The weather, one of our challenges in Ireland is our weather. We've damp, wet, we've damp, damp, wet winters, and our dung, because of silage diets, can be a bit looser. So that creates the perfect environment for bacteria. Uh, so running the scrapers a bit more. Uh, something as simple as ventilation. Think about it, you know, one thing bacteria don't like is fresh air, <clears throat> excuse me. So, you know, and cows produce a massive amount of heat. So just look at ventilation on the shed. It might be just taking off boards and sheds or opening sheds up more when it comes to cows. And um, when, when you talk about topless cubicles, it can be a challenge. I'd always say if, you're, if you have topless cube, cubicles, your long term planning should be maybe uh, around having a roof over it because that's all we want to do is keep the rain and moisture uh, as much as possible, as low as possible. So that will be some of my key things. Um, I suppose I've covered a lot of ground as usual. Um, but there are my six key areas to, to think about this year. Um, we need to get better on the bugs. We need to get an understanding of what bugs are on the farm. And the future will be around probably more tr focused treatment uh, or lack of, or, or not treating bugs based on what they are. Hygiene is so important and it's gonna get very critical now as cows come in. That extra attention to detail at key risk times a year, particularly the 14 days after drying off, coming up to calving time. Antibiotics aren't going anywhere. They're a precious resource. We just need to make sure when we use them that we use them correctly and get the best results we possibly can and know when the time is to say that they're not going to give us results. You know, immunity is so key um, to, to the herd. So look at a herd level, what could be affecting immunity. Look, we're lucky in a sense when it comes to, you know, some of the diseases that deal with like respiratory disease and different things. We've got the data there. None of us like, like using it. But look at milk records now. They're telling us more than just about cell count. They're telling us about herd performance. And ultimately, it's down to your own mindsets around where your milk quality is, how engaged you want to be with selective dry cow therapy, um, and, and, and do it step by step. And I think we can see significant improvements. We've nothing to be afraid of. We're doing some great work on the farm. And finally, I suppose don't forget about, I always take this opportunity, the metrics that matter as well. You know, take, take as you come up to drying off cows and you have that bit of time, and um, that you, you spend time on the things that matter. And, and look, it's a very strange and difficult time for everybody. And um, so just look after your own selves uh, as well. So I think that's, um, that's it for me. I'm going to stop sharing. I see I have a good few questions here have come in as well. Um, I have two questions that have come in before. Um, okay. Technology, the gift that keeps giving. Um, uh, oh yeah, okay. Yeah, so a, a good comment here as well by um, William, Fitzger William Fitzgerald that the quality of sterility during milk sampling is massive. So many milk samples are sent to the labs contaminated. I think that's a really important. So to re-emphasize that point that, you know, when you're taking a milk sample that you um, make sure that the, your gloves are on, you're scrubbing that teeth end, you're discarding um, the first two or three squirts in the quarter, that you totally avoid uh, contamination. Um, and actually a good friend of mine, John Gilmore, uh, a farm lab vets, has a very good video on YouTube on, on, on the protocol, it's a short one. So that's a really good point by, by William Fitzgerald as well. I think you're up and running, Brian, are you? I think so at last, yeah. Very good. Thanks again, Tommy, that, that was excellent. Um, so, I'm here on behalf of Smax Tech today, and I just want to explain basically who we are, what we do, and of course, how we can benefit you. Uh, Smax Tech, they're a young, innovative company from Austria, agri-tech company, that have created this unique bolus that measures activity, core temperature, true rumination, water intake, and pH. I'm Brian Hearn, I'm the country manager uh, for Smax Tech, and I've been in the business, the dairy industry for the last 18 years. I've seen, I suppose, in the last number of years, the, the need for efficiency with bigger cow numbers and less labor. Um, so I think that's what really attracted me to, to Smax Tech and, and the bolus technology. I suppose, first of all, the, the fact that it's, it's a safe device, it sits in the cow's stomach. But I, I think from the other side, it's the accuracy of the data that's coming back. It, it's really unique uh, with this advanced technology. 
just to explain about the the system, it's it's electronic bolus and it it's put it's applied through the mouth and sits in the ruminant. Uh, and uh, basically, it provides all the, the 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 best data and allowing you to make the best decisions for the for the cow and, and for the herd. So, just on a practical level, you can see here that the there's a base station that's our new base station up at the right hand side. It's about three meters off the ground level. It's Laura One technology. And basically when the, the cows come into the collecting yard for milking, the data is collected uh, and sent up to the space station and processed. It's sent to the cloud and sent back down to your alert before the cows exit the parlor. That's allowing you to, to make uh, any decisions you have to before the cows get out. Alerts that you, you will receive on your phone or, or on your laptop. Uh, you can see up at the left hand side the suitor, uh, the baby suitor, that's for imminent calving. Uh, below it, then you have uh, the cow sweating, which is, is heat stress. And I don't think uh, we don't have as much problems with that here in Ireland, but still, it's something that we can measure and we can measure humidity and uh, ambient temperature of the building inside as well with our with our sensor for for that. Um, down below it, we have the cows mounting, that's heat detection, and um, that's an alert you'll get when the cows are in heat. Down below it is the cow thrown down, basically she's inactive. Um, up on top in the middle is the rumination. That's our new feature, that our new parameter that we can measure. Um, to the right of that, you can see the temperature gauge, which is, is the blue, the drop in temperature basically or decrease in temperature and below at the bottom you have the increased temperature with that symbol and to the right you have the insufficient water intake and below that is reduced feeding so th these are the alerts that you would see coming up on on your phone uh, just to, to explain some of the benefits for the, the end user uh, heat detection i suppose is the first one i, I want to talk about uh, we measure heat detection with true activity in, in the time of the cycle. We're looking at increased activity. We're also looking at a decrease in rumination. We look at temperature spikes at that time and also the frequency of water intake. Uh, with all these parameters together, we're getting very pre precise data coming back on, on heat detection. We also have a heat index which suppresses the data and uh, gives you a very accurate time when the cow is actually after breaking the threshold and she's actually in heat. Um, when, when you confirm the, the heat detection, uh, a window will come up. It's an insemination window. You can see it at the right hand side at the bottom. It's very easy. It's a traffic light system. So it's give you the optimum time to inseminate the cow. Uh, on the calving alert, again, I think with increased cow numbers and uh, space at a premium for calving, this is an excellent feature. Basically, it's done scientifically. The, the temperature of the cow drops when she's in the calving window. It drops half a degree to a degree, typically 15 to 20 hours before the calving event happens. And it allows you the time to get her into that pin and have be ready for it. So I just put up on the right-hand side JIT, and that means just in time that it's not too early, not too late. We, we don't want cows calving in the cubicle house or we don't want to have cows in for three or four days uh, wasting premium space, as I say, and straw. And uh, I suppose being in a position where you have to, to pike in, hate them for a few days. So I think this is an excellent feature. Um, that's that. And I, I think, you know, the feedback I'm getting is that it's well over percent. I think this is very unique from, from the point of view of is, is that we and believe that um, any early infection, the there's going to be a deviation with temperature. 
and it's the first sign before production drops, before feeding stops, before the cow even looks off. And again, if she could talk, she could she could tell us, but she can't. So I think that's that's a, a, an excellent feature to have is the, the core body temperature. And again, it's the accuracy of that. Along with the true rumination, that's our new new parameter that we're using our new technology is also the rumination. I think it tells an awful lot about uh, what's happening with the cow. Uh, along with a decrease in activity and obviously water intake is a very important one as well if, if there's less frequency of water intake. And of course feeding. Feeding is a big part of it as well. So just, I suppose, just to point out again uh, that the temperature we're measuring is inside and it's the same spot. It's consistent. It's There's no extremities from the outside coming in to affect the temperature. So temperature taken anywhere else, rectal or ear temperature is affected by outside. So I think the fact that we can measure at an accuracy of 0 0.05 degrees accuracy is a big part of this, that we can use the calving alerts, but also we can detect early illness with the, the core body temperature at that level. These are the, the, the diseases that we, we can pick up. Um, one of the big ones, of course, is, is mastitis, and you, you spoke about that there, Tommy, as well. And the way we measure this is increased activity or increased temperature over time. So typically four days before any infection, this is where the temperature starts to increase. And we can see that with a drop in activity as well and the increase of, of temperature. Metritis after calving, we can detect this. Um, milk fever, one, one of your own um, things to talk about. Uh, Tommy, I've often heard you speak about milk fever. That's another big one. Yeah, I, I'm interested. Like obviously, I think if I was to pick out a, 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 a challenge for dairy farms over the last 12 months, it was milk fever, uh, and even I did, I'd say I met 60 dairy farmers in a couple of meetings the last three weeks. It, it came up time and time again. So I suppose for me, it's early identification. I'm working very closely with two farms at the moment that are going to put in the are, are about to put in the bolus, and we're really going to be looking at this as one of the parameters we'll, we'll be trying to monitor on farm and get in there early. So you know, from that perspective, it's a, it's a big challenge on a lot, a lot of virus farms, no doubt. Sorry to interrupt you, Brian. No, no, that, that's, that's fine. Uh, the pneumonia obviously is another big one, and we're we're looking definitely, as you said, for the first sixty days after for, after calving. Um, the also the, the fact that we can measure core temperature and rumination now, and not alone rumination, just the motility of the stomach and the way the stomach is moving, and the contractions of the muscles. We can also pick up uh, displaced abomasums earlier twisted guts, any steel or nails in the stomach, we can pick up all that very early in the time. Grass tetany, another big one that's um, that can be detected with, with the the increased temperature again, and um, obviously the, the activity of the cow slowing down. And um, the the SAR, SAR from the from the point of view of pH and ketosis, we can we can also detect these. Uh, just to just talk a bit about our new true roomy technology that's our trademark for what what we believe is true rumination uh, where rumination starts in the reticulum give us the most precise and robust data back uh, along with the other parameters this is is going to optimize your dairy farm with ease so i think this is this is a very is a game changer for us um, to have this level of technology with true rumination um, just, just to talk a small bit about feeding, uh, when we when we measure pH, we're we're looking at feed efficiency, and what we're trying to achieve is a flat, boring line with not too much base or not too much acid. Um, this is something that, again, from a feeding point of view, has to be right, and uh, it allows us to to get higher feed efficiency, higher productivity, obviously, and lower cost. Uh, the beauty about this system is, you know, it's it's in your pocket. You you can access it anytime, anywhere, and it's always close. It's you know twenty four seven. It's there the whole time, and I think th the fact that it's it's easy to use is a big part of it as well. It's not a herd management system, but it does do management by exception. So it will alert you to this, and I think it's important that. Like any system, it's it's being trained up properly, and it is very important. 
um, it's only as good as, as the person that's using it and the information that's going into it. Uh, and I think with the help of our support team, that makes it very easy. And I think it's it's important to say that, you know, it, it's when the customer is comfortable with the system, not not when the, the trainer is, you know, is, is comfortable. Uh, it, I think it, it makes the whole thing a lot easier. So it, it's that support mechanism behind us, that contact that we give um, for the first six weeks, but also ongoing into the into the the system using the system, it's very important. Uh, just just to finish up and to summarize, um, again, it's it's electronic bolus that sits in the stomach. But what makes us different and unique is the fact that we can measure core body temperature, we can measure drinking behavior, we can do very accurate calving predictions. We can uh, measure rumination, where it all starts, measuring the uh, rumen contractions um, and the ticks in the rumen. And of course, we can also measure the rumen pH. And uh, I suppose just just to finish off, uh, I think that someone mentioned me the other day, my, my son actually said to me, asked me about the, the bonus, he called it. Uh, I explained to him, or was about to explain to him that it wasn't, it was a bolus, but I stopped myself to say that it actually is a bonus. It's about the bolus is a bonus. It saves time and it saves money. So um, that's my uh, details down at the bottom. And I'm happy to answer any questions or, or give me a, a ring sometime and I can go on farm. Uh, my email address there is, is there also. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone today for for participating and hopefully it was some benefit. I'd like to thank Tommy also again for that presentation. I think I think it's it was very good. And uh, that's it, I suppose. I'll hand I'll hand it over to Tommy there again for the last word and any few questions. Yeah, thanks a million, Brian. Uh, I'm usually spoiled at this stage for the questions are asked to me, but I had to go back there. Some great questions. Um, I maybe might have rushed uh, Darren's question there on on-farm diagnostics. Um, I suppose they're an investment, they're a cost on the farm. You've got to look at how, how you use them correctly, the maintenance of the incubator. They certainly, the way things are going would make sense. Um, I certainly think more veterinary practices are doing cultures now as well. Um, and certainly there's lots of labs there, but it's it's something probably farms will, will, will definitely be considering in the future. And that Acumat system is I've looked at a few of them and I think that's that's certainly something of interest. Um, just a couple of other questions. There was a question about the teeth barrier after you use the teeth seal. So I had a picture of the teeth barrier. Is that more effective than traditional spraying or post teeth dipping? Um, <clears throat> my instinct is yes. Um, I suppose I'm sort of very lucky that I'm getting back to a very practical level on two farms with this new project. So we're, we're looking at, the, at them as a way that they just make sense. We've only started using them. Um, and I think I, I would say it's just an extra layer. Look, some people say it's an extra cost, but it's such a critical time. I think they make more sense. Um, there was another question around, there was a suggestion, and it was a very good suggestion around heifer management. And that's, you know, getting your heifers through the parlor pre-calving time to get them used to the parlor, feeding them a little bit of meal. You have the option of spraying teeth at that time as well, because it's the time when they're starting to bag up a colostrum. Um, and then you start turning on the machine stress is dramatically reduced and now that will seem like work to other people but we cannot overemphasize uh, stress uh, on heifers in particularly as they come into the power so that was a great suggestion uh, there was another question there on uh, bovine um, herpes mam mammalitis does that cause mastitis and like whoever asked that question has found my weak spot it's one of these diseases that i've always struggled with to give very good advice on it's a virus that affects the outside of the teeth so does it cause mastitis it causes mastitis because of what it does to the skin tissue around the teeth end particularly um, and you get when you damage any skin you'll get more bacterial proliferation so um, it won't cause cell count issues but it can open the door for other issues and it's very difficult to manage and just make sure it's highly contagious as well when you are when you have cows there that you're at least dipping clusters between them um, and they take a bit of time and time and healing often involves not milking that quarter for 24 or, or 48 hours which can be a challenge so um, I think I've covered a lot of the questions uh, there's a question came in um, there Brian and I was trying to figure out but I think I think we did maybe answer it uh, but is how accurate is the system at, at, at uh, um, at, at detecting milk fever. Yeah, I think the important point again to remember is that we can measure at 0 0.05 degree of accuracy. And 
again, temperature will drop with mill fever. Activity will drop also on rumination, but um, the first sign would be the temperature drop. And the fact that we're so accurate with the, the temperature from inside the, the core temperature, you know, it's the earliest time you can pick up mill fever. And I think it's important to say that again, that it's so important, you know, when a cold goes down, you need to get her up fast again and it's it being in there early. And I don't think there's any other system that could measure it as fast because of the, the core body temperature again and the accuracy of that. And, and what I, of course, from my perspective, I suppose, is it's all about the herd. If you're if you're getting two cases of mint fever, if you're getting these early identifications, you just don't, it's not a great excuse to just, okay, we'll, we'll bowl some, but look maybe at herd level, what's happening. Um, just Definitely. one other question I didn't answer, and there's one more for you, Brian, then, and I'm conscious of time. Um, I, uh, is there a difference between uh, dipping, um, spraying, and 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 post heat dipping? Um, not in my opinion. Once it's done correctly, um, there's different volumes involved. All I think people need to do is match the dip to the challenge. So, what time of year is it? You know, are cows indoors? Um, what's the heat condition like? Um, are you using enough dip first of all? So the volume is critical. If you're spraying, it's 15 mils per cow over 100 cows. That's uh, you know, so it's twice a day work out that if it's post tea dipping it's 10 mils per day per cow per milking should I say um, and the next thing is the viscosity of the dip so um, if it's a barrier dip that's required maybe coming into winter time or early calving is that been provided and then the, the visually they were covering the whole teeth at the back of the barrel of the teeth uh, the furthest part of it isn't been in covered so they're my simple tips but when they're applied correctly no there isn't but look at your teeth what's your teeth condition like what's your mastitis like review the overall program um, often teeth dips won't solve mastitis issues they're a component of it um, Brian there's one last question there for, for you um, I think I've covered everything there um, how is heat activity picked up and how accurate is it yeah, again, I, the fact that we have more than one parameter, the, the base parameter we use for for heat detection is activity. And again, we can, with the bolus, we can check our activity. That's the first thing it was. And with the new technology, we can also check the rumination, the, 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 the rumination, the drop and dro rumination. And again, I think that's belt and braces when it comes to heat detection, but also we can look at spikes in temperature and water intake at that time to, to build up a profile of what's going on. The, the fact that we have the heat index, that really suppresses the data so we can see exactly when she was in heat, if it's two o'clock in the morning. And also, uh, I think it's important to say that we can adjust thresholds depending on the farm, depending on the, the, the management on the farm. So with our customer support team, we can actually tailor suited to that farm, you know, from, from the point of view of, of accuracy. Um, also, I think it's important, again, that we can measure the cow against the herd, which is very important in grazing, because otherwise it could be paddock 21 this evening and they'd all be in heat. So that's important to say that we can do pasture uh, or grazing with heat detection very accurately as well. It doesn't make a difference if they're inside or outside. We have that covered. Uh, but Going back to, I think, activity number one, drop and rumination. That, that's the built in braces for heat detection. Okay. Uh, I just see one last question here, and I'll let people go then. Bruce, Bruce has asked, would it be beneficial to me me measure the uh, external heat sealer to prevent early lactation mastitis and first calvers if used two weeks prior to calving? What is the efficacy? Great question by Bruce. Uh, I think this, the common sense would say it would help. Um, I certainly am going to tr trial it or use it in heifers this year um, common sense would say that it should work or should help um, would be my answer to that I'm sure Bruce will have further questions for me on that okay so that's it uh, Brian thank you very much for that um, insightful um, in, in, insights into smack take bolus and what it can do um, technology is going to be another component of helping farms with I suppose the animal health challenges and reduction in antibiotics and all those things so thank you for your sponsorship for this webinar I'd like to thank everybody who has taken time out of their busy schedules for attending this webinar in these strange times um, I'm getting used to webinars but uh, technology always get, throws something along the way that makes you uh, want to be back uh, in, with, with real people looking in their eyes again. Um, okay, so that's it for today. I will have a recording of this webinar hopefully up over the weekend as well so people can pick through it again. Thank you very much and thank you, Brian. Thanks, Tommy.